Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Shreyas Sen. I'm from C. Birdie, uh, where I direct the Spark Lab. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for the kind introduction. We work very closely with Professor Arijit Roy Choudhury's um, lab at Georgia Tech on IoT sensor nodes. And today we will be talking about context aware ultra low power energy harvested IoT sensor nodes. The previous talk, uh, uh, self powered sensors, was a great prelude to this. In this talk, we are going to focus on the 1 microwatt to 1 milliwatt range and see how we can make this modular sensor approach and start to merge some of these modules and make them extremely low power to bridge the gap between what energy is available and what the electronics in the sensor consumes. This talk will focus on the electronics and not so much on the transducer. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge the graduate students in both our labs and colleagues at Intel Labs. With last five decades of continuous shrinking of device size, uh, the size of unit computing has been reducing significantly. Starting with mainframe in 1960s, we went through PCs in 1990s and laptops in 2000s. We are living in the age of tablets and smartphones now. By 2020, the size of unit computation will be so small that it will be virtually all around us in mostly invisible places. Computation ubiquitous and will turn everything things into smart objects. This has already started, but it will become a more a reality going forward that we will live in a world of smart connected sensors. We will be all completely surrounded by them. These sensors will be recording stuff, analyzing stuff, giving feedback to through the cloud as well as within themselves and processing information all around us. So we saw with Moore's law, devices have become very small. Along with that, Tremendous progress in wireless connectivity following Shannon's law has enabled the connectivity to these small sensors. And the junction of Moore's law and Shannon's law, we are living in the world of IoT or Internet of Things. Though this enables a swarm of connected control and sensing, the biggest problem in these devices uh, is energy efficiency. Because either you have to put in a battery and then the devices are bulky and you have to replace the battery once in a while or you would want them to be energy harvested but then there is no the harvesting technology is uh, not so much what the harvesting technology can do and what the electronics need there is a wide gap between that as the previous uh, presenter mentioned so we'll see how we can bridge that gap this slide uh, this shows the human population growth over last few years and the projected growth that is steadily increasing. At, uh, however, the number of connected devices in 2003 was 0.5 billion. It crossed the number of humans in the earth around the 2008 time frame. And we are living in this range now. By 2020, Cisco predicts that there will be more than 50 billion connected devices, as all of you know. And these devices would generate a tremendous amount of data. So by 2020, some estimates say that it would be 30 exabytes of data, that's 30 billion gigabytes of data per month traversing this network. The question comes, how can we provide the energy for it? How, how can we make this uh, energy efficient? So that brings us to the framework of the talk. This I, the IoT sensors have the sensor nodes, and they are wirelessly connected to the cloud where the back-end computations are happening and uh, analytics are happening. Data is being sensed here using always-on sensing with some kind of in-situ analytics. That was the first part of the talk. And then that data needs to be communicated to the cloud and some uh, data from the cloud needs to come back over here for control, model update and things like that. That is the second part of the talk. The sensor node also needs harvesting and battery uh, that we will not cover that part in the talk. So we'll start with always on sensing and in situ analytics. We'll uh, go over two examples, one for audio and another for video, and see how 
we can make audio recording and video gesture recognition uh, significantly lower power so that we can support energy harvesting. So for audio, we all know we can say, uh, "Okay, Google," or we can call the Alexa, and it wakes up. Right. So what is there is the microphone, and after that there is a speech recognition engine. The speech recognition engine consumes a lot of power, and hence you cannot keep it on all the time. So in front of the speech recognition engine, sorry, uh, you could put some kind of a wake, wake up detector, which is implemented in software. That too is more power hungry than what you can support for always on listening. And that's why you see in your phone, you have to uh, turn on some button and then you, it starts listening. But what we really want is a voice activity detector that can be always on. For that to happen, it has to be some microwatts of power consumption. And so this example that was published in CICC and JCCC in 2012 and 13 time frame shows such a voice activated uh, T detector that consumes only 100 microwatts. The block diagram uh, is you take the signal in perform a FFT, it goes through some filters, and the energy is found as well as the noise is estimated. And the difference of the energy and the noise give, tells you if there is a voice uh, present or not. The key thing to notice here is if you implemented this in a CPU uh, with jet algorithms, what the ki kind of energy it consumes. From there, if you implement it using a DSP, you can get a 100x benefit. And from the DSP, if you go to the ASIC that was designed over here, you can get another 18x benefit. So to really enable uh, always on voice sensing on our energy harvested device, you need something like this. Uh, the key techniques that were used were serializing of the voice so that the activity of switching is matched with the optimum energy point of a transistor, uh, which is close, somewhere close to the NTV point or near threshold voltage point. Next, you want to operate every component at its lowest energy point. So memory, as you know, needs higher minimum supply than logic, so we they, they used a dual supply uh, for one for memory, one for logic. Other simplifications in, uh, included uh, using blocks which have less connectivity, uh, less or less interconnect length, so that total power is lower. Similarly, reconfiguration was used to achieve minimum power at different points. This shows the chip photo. And this shows the measured results. So whenever, as you see, whenever voice comes in, it can detect the output. A more interesting plot is over here. The blue shows the signal energy, and the red shows the estimated noise flow. So whenever voice is not there, they are similar. Whenever voice is there, the difference between the curve uh, represents the detection uh, accuracy. So on the uh, x, so this shows the amount of power it consumes. On the x-axis is the supply voltage of the logic as well as the memory. As you can see, the, as the supply voltage scales down, the total power reduces. The memory uh, scaling stops around 0.8. The logic scaling went up to 0.4. This is why you needed dual supply. And this shows the inner, uh, number of frames per joule, that is the energy efficiency. It's maximum around uh, 0.65 volts, which is the, the near threshold voltage. And it is 9.4x better than the nominal supply of that process. What this also means, as you are scaling down the uh, supply, the time that you need to compute is increasing. So if you can implement just-in-time computation, meaning you uh, your transistor performance is matched with your load that is required, then you can achieve the maximum energy efficiency. So we showed a voice activity detector that operates at 100 microwatt and uh, can enable always on recognition. Next, uh, we talk about the always on video or gesture recognition. As you can imagine, video is, for video the problem is insanely harder because there are so many pixels and so many uh, frames per second that are required. So what was done was a compressive sensing was used on these uh, 
image sensors or the video sensors and then in the compressed domain uh, analytics was done to detect if there is a gesture or not and because you are performing on the compressed compressed domain as you will see this can provide something like 800x benefit compared to doing it in the normal domain so first on a frame by frame basis it is determined that if there is significant change or not only so this is the always on path only if there is change then also we uh, they did not do it on the full data then you do some kind of a feature extraction so that you can get another level of compression and on the feature extracted data you do a pattern matching using a match filter if a match is found at that point the rate of the measurement is increased so that you can have more information the extra energy is only consumed when there is activity and when there is not much activity just this tiny block is gone this is how you can uh, get extreme low power implementations as you can see the the always on mode has very low number of measurements and then the high power high performance mode gives you the uh, information fidelity that you require this shows uh, the hardware of the first completely solar power gesture recognition camera and this was co widely covered in the press earlier this year uh, you see the camera over here and these are the solar panel and there is no battery supply over here and it can detect gestures as we will see in the next few slides what is done is from the camera the frame difference and uh, random linear measurements are done from there motion centers are ex extracted and then using dynamic time warping the motion sensors are processed to recognize the gesture on the top you see different gestures of uh, one of arjit students and the domain in which the computation is happening is this so as you can see all the sparsity is removed and but still because it is adaptive you can detect the gestures correctly and there is a 800 almost 800x compression from top to bottom that's what is enabling uh, in a operation under energy harvesting for such devices uh, on the x-axis here it shows the number of measurements and uh, the red one shows the recognition accuracy and green, uh, blue one shows the energy per frame so as you see as you reduce the number of measurements the energy re per frame reduces but after some point so up to some point there is graceful degradation after some point the recognition accuracy decreases significantly so this is where the design point was chosen so that the degradation is not so much but the energy savings is higher and this shows the performance of this device the recognition accuracy and the power uh, for three different cases under sunlight bright indoor and office light so as you can see in sunlight and bright indoors uh, the system worked with pretty decent uh, recognition accuracy higher than 80 percent close to 90 percent and then under office light because there is so less energy available the recognition accuracy goes down so until now we looked at two uh, in sensor analytic techniques to enable always on vo voice and video recognition next we will see that we, we have sensed this uh, information we have compressed it using the in sensor analytics how can we communicate this information as the previous speaker was mentioning this wireless communication is extremely uh, high energy overhead so how can we enable those to understand the landscape better uh, this slide summarizes some of the energy efficiency of typical wireless communication we call uh, review 4g wi-fi bluetooth bluetooth le and y gig on the x-axis is the distance between the two nodes and the y-axis is energy per bit so as you know in wireless if you are farther you have more loss to so you need to support more power either in the transmitter power or in the receive to reduce the receiver noise figure so that you are more sensitive so longer distance needs higher power and also faster bandwidth needs higher power so for a uh, bluetooth le which transmits around uh, megabits per second we see it it takes about 10 to 15 nanojoule per bit Wi-Fi at 54 megabits per second is right around 5 nanojoule per bit or so. If you go to 802.11ac where we go to MIMO and 
8 cross 8 MIMO enables very high speed data rates. That is also a little bit above a nanojoule per bit. And similarly, if you go to 60 gigahertz OFDM, that is 802.11AD, which can only go to 3 to 5 meters, uh, that's sometimes a little bit less than nanojoule, sometimes a little bit more. So, on an average, we can uh, see that wireless communication between two nodes are taking a nanojoule per bit uh, or more. And we will see, uh, use this number to see what is really possible and what is not. We compare two cases. Uh, one is a high data rate system, example being wireless video or surveillance or gaming. So, for example, if you consider a 4K video at 30 frames per second with R, uh, GB and 12 bit color depth, the raw data rate comes out to be 9.56 gigabits per second. At 1 nanojoule per bit, that translates to 10 watt. Our typical mobile battery is 5 to 10 watt hour capacity, which means your battery just supporting the communication of this video will run out in less than an hour. Forget about processing and everything else. So that's what the, we are here and we need at least 10x or much more uh, improvement to be able to support such high data rate from a battery, uh, battery. And as you know, the battery uh, technology is progressing. Uh, pretty slowly. That calls for an energy gap that needs to be merged. Similarly, for on the other end of the spectrum, where you look at very low data rate devices, these are the sensors that are all around us and we would like to make these sensors energy harvested. So, if you look at an example of 1 nanojoule per bit and 1 megabits per second, that turns out to be a milliwatt, which is over here. Uh, but if you look at the harvesting modalities that are available as uh, he was showing in the previous slide, they are either in the uh, very low power range and at the best something like light, vibrational, thermal and uh, RF or inductive can harvest between 50 to 200 microwatt max. That means there is an, also a 10x gap in the extremely low power net zero or energy harvested IO switch sensor nodes. So, we have to bring this electronics down by 10x to be able to build such devices. Better understand why wireless needs so much energy and uh, the amount of variability that is present in different contexts for uh, a wireless communication. Let us consider the point to point communication between two devices. You have one device uh, from fundamentals of electromagnetics, we know that close to that there is a near field region and then there is a far field region outside of it. So, when you have a device, sometimes uh, could be in the very close range, so within the near field region or in the far field region very far away with an interfere, which means you have a tiny signal and a strong interference, uh, signal very close to your noise floor and you have to still handle the interference or even in the far field region, it could be somewhere close by without an interference. So, the amount of energy you need for different are very different, Among the processing power you need is very different. Now, the question that we are really asking is, how can you build electronics that are optimum for all these different cases? To find the answer, we take a cue from nature and see, uh, notice that human brain does not process everything equally. It adapts to its surroundings and learns over experience how to operate efficiently. When you were born, we do not know much, we slowly learn and know how to do every task efficiently. That is what the electronics should do as well. So, for different cases, it should adapt. There is some adaptation in software that already happens like adaptive modulation and coding and transmit power control, but most of the hardware is still fixed today. So, we need a completely adaptive system such that with low overhead, such that you can go from, you can only burn the minimum amount of power needed for each case. Also, with that, maybe you can get savings like 3 to 5, uh, up to 3x, but you might have to switch your phi or physical layer technique that is used for communication as your context changes then only you can achieve significant more savings and we will show some examples for that. 
So uh, on the communication part, we'll cover two cases: one intrafi adaptation, and we'll give an example of a self-learning radio. And then we'll cover interfi adaptation. So we'll show how by switching to another completely new physical layer, you can get significant more savings. So we start with the intrafi adaptation. So in today's design, we are here. So we generally do worst case design. On the x-axis, we are seeing channel conditions, uh, namely path loss, interference or fading. So the nominal is somewhere in the middle and this is the worst case. We generally design our electronics for worst case plus some guard band so that you can tolerate from process variation and some uncertainties. Uh, so this is called the design margin. And because you are here, it's an easy design. You just guard band things. It's guaranteed to work, but this is coming at a cost of significant energy penalty like 3x. So we said, can we build these adaptive radios? And we demonstrated that if you put in, uh, if you sense the quality of the channel and the electronics at every point and add up, you can do much better. When you want to implement certain things, of course, you need some sensors embedded into the front end. For example, this uh, sensor can tell you what is the interference strength is. And then if your interference is present, you increase linearity. If your interference is not present, you reduce linear. You operate at voltage mode and extremely low powers. Similarly, you need a final sensor which would give you a system level metric which is very correlated with your bit error rate. So we use something called uh, EVM. I will go into more details about that. So you need a sensors, you need tuning knobs in the front end so that based on the sensed information, you can come back and provide power versus performance trade off in the hardware itself that is consuming some power to give you some performance. And then finally, you need a control law that by looking into this sensor data can provide the right values to this control law in real time as you are receiving data, as you are sensing uh, things and transmitting to the cloud. So we implemented uh, this and we called it a channel adaptive RF or dynamic or visor, zero margin RF. And we could achieve about 2 to 3x in the best case. One problem with this device is though the uh, control law, the control law you build is for the nominal device, but we de design these electronics in a nanoscale process where there is a lot of variation. So you have to guard band for this variation again. Or your control law for the nominal device is not applicable for your process varied device. So one way to fix that is you start build, putting in process sensors into these devices and sense the process corner and update the control law according to the process corner. Then you have something that is process variation tolerant and dynamically uh, adapting to the channel to consume the minimum energy at all points. The problem with that is it needs high design time over it because you have to design this control law for all possible process corner variations or at least at some discrete uh, granular fit. That brings us to the fact that why are you trying to model this? Like human brain, why don't we build the fundamentals and let it learn. So that brings us to the self-learning radio where you would have the sensors and you will learn the control law based on your experience. So you will run real-time experiments while you are receiving data. So on day zero, you will start at nominal power. That, uh, that is the worst case power that today's devices consume. And from there you will learn. And as you learn, your power consumption should go down. So we implemented that radio using the following techniques. For the ad RX adaptive operation, we need two phases. In the one is the explore phase, where you are exploring how for a given channel condition and a given tuning knob, my final tuning knob value, my final uh, receive signal is. So you explore that during runtime packets. And then you, you record all of that data, F represents the channel condition, T represents the tuning of value in the hardware and if is the metric error vector magnitude which is correlated with the bit error rate but can be calculated in real time. Bit error rate cannot be calculated in real time. 
it needs several symbols, so it cannot be fast. And a consumption. You record that data, and in the adapt state, which is done you in some idle time, like while charging at night, you analyze this data and build a map. So, what maps do we need? What we are trying to understand is what is the hardware power consumption for any given tuning knob. So, a map between a tuning knob and a power, and also uh, tuning knob and the channel condition to performance, which is your EVM. So, you need one model for power, one model for power. And we use neural networks because neural network can nonlinearly model these performances well, uh, these models well. So, we took this data and modeled, uh, built two neural network maps for power and performance. And then in the optimization phase, we find out given any channel condition, what is the best tuning of combination for this hardware which already has the process variation included. So, that is this phase. And then once you find that, so over all f, once you find this t op, that is your control law. So, you keep on sensing f and you keep on applying the right t op and you are always at the minimum power. So, this is a uh, little more details about the explode phase. In the explode phase, uh, there could be real packets or there could be these exploratory packets. So, we check the exploratory packet. If it is, then we rapidly apply some tuning knob combination and check the, we know what the channel is, we apply the tune, random tuning knob and we check the performance and power and record it. If not, if it is not an experimental packet and it is a real packet, then we need to detect it. So, we have two options. Either we have previously experienced this packet and we know the T opt for it, which is already here, then we apply the T opt. Or this is the first time we are experiencing a similar channel and then we just apply the nominal value. The nominal value is your worst case value that you would have otherwise applied in today's devices. So, with that nominal value, we know that we will be able to receive the packet is just optimum, non-optimum to start. So, this is how we are exploring. Uh, so, over time, you keep on building up this optimized table and at some point, you have experienced all channel conditions or representative space of all channel conditions and then you can only operate. At that point, the uh, experimentation stops and you have an optimized device that self learn through experiments. So, from the data in the explore phase, we like I mentioned, we build these two neural networks of power and performance, two maps and also we have to keep a, a map saying that okay, we have explored these channel conditions. So, there is a table which shows okay, these are already explored. And this is done by using an evolving clustering method. Uh, where, so we do not know what are the possible channel conditions when you are starting, right. So, we, we experience them and use ECM to cluster them automatically. So, in summer, uh, uh, in short, it basically builds these maps and finally, during optimization, we have both of these maps power as a function of tuning knob and EV performance as a function of channel and tuning knob. So, during the optimization, we need to find the, for any given channel, what is the optimum value of the tuning. So, we do that using a constraint minimization technique where it says minimize power given performance is less than quality of service required. Uh, I mentioned about neural networks and as you would know that neural net, uh, so let me go back, neural networks have the input and output layers and multiple hidden layers. So, you could have more hidden layers or you can have more neurons per layer. So, with both, with more neurons per layer and more hidden layers, your quality of the model in improves, but the hardware power over it increases. So, for this implementation, we chose a 15 layer per neuron and two hidden layers, 15 neurons per layer. Okay. So, we have at nominal day, uh, at day 0, we do not know how the behavior should be for any given channel. Over time, we are exp exploring different channels and this represents on on the x axis path loss, on the y axis uh, interference strength. So, these are the channels that have been explored at some 
t equal to t intermediate and these are the optimized powers for those explored channel conditions. This process as the process keeps on going, this map is being filled up at t equal to t final, we have the complete uh, picture and the complete map for optimum tuning knobs and the power for each of them. And we could see about a 2.5x savings in uh, this case from above for, for the best case implementation. We built uh, some custom hardware uh, or ICs for these tuning knobs and we also built a full demonstration of the wireless system which shows on the x axis is the number of days and on the y axis is the power. So, this is the nom nominal power that a typical worst case wireless device consumes because you have the learning overhead initially the power is little bit more than that, but then as you are learning this shows the power of the device across all, aver all channel the average of power across all channel conditions. So, that average reduces because you are learning and you are finding the optimum for different channels and at some point you have explored most of the channels and you can stop this learning experience and the learning over it goes away. So, as you see there is significant savings if you self learn and adapt the wireless receiver. However, the savings we are talking about is at the best case 2 to 3 x which is good, but might not be good at in all cases we might be able to do better. So, what we explored until now is within the phi intra phi we were adapting to remove guard band and always be minimum power or there could be cases where you can switch the phi in our mobile or some devices we have multiple radios or multiple communication techniques at different uh, uh, integrated into the device. Sometimes we should switch the physical layer to be get better energy efficiency. So, next we will show one example of such case where when we have two devices very close almost touching which it how can we be significantly more energy efficient compared to something like millimeter wave or traditional wireless. It is called proximate communication. So, the pursuit here is how can you get greater than 10x energy efficiency. The road to that is hard often impossible for the same standard. If you say I am going to get the same performance and uh, same uh, standard like BTLE and I would get 10x lower that, that is not available people have already optimized for it in most cases. So, the goal there is to self learn and choose the most energy efficient phi for the given context. What do we mean by context? Context could be the application like voice or video that we are trying to operate with the battery condition. Do I have a lot of juice in my battery or is it running out? It could be the latency required and it should include the current channel conditions and based on the context, context we should choose the optimum physical layer that can do the best job. We will give some examples. For example, today's mobile have the RF uh, radio which works at uh, so for example, Wi Fi works at 2.4 gigahertz and it can go up to 10 meter to a, a, a kilometer uh, if you implement uh, using a certain techniques. You also have millimeter wave which is around 60 gigahertz, it is much it can only go up to a meter, but when things are very close we are talking about a millimeter scale communication where if you use either of those you will be extremely inefficient inefficient and we introduce a technique called proximity communication where we can see significant more benefits. So, to understand the energy benefit again we come the curve uh, uh, graph of energy distance and only plot the 5 gigabits per second plus wire free communication techniques. So, the 5 uh, this range you of course, you can do a lot if you have a wire connect, but that is not what you are talking about. So, we have for comparison we have the BTLE, but we have the MIMO and the Y gig that we have talked about and this is Y gig with digital baseband. And digital baseband because these are working at 2 gigabit uh, hertz, they are pretty high power. There are some implementations uh, out of Berkeley which shows if you do 60 gigahertz single carrier with analog baseband, you can achieve 20 picojoule per bit. But we are going to show you today is called proximity communication, it can achieve 32 gigabits per second and this goes up to 1 meter, our 
it's up to a millimeter, but it can achieve 32 gigabits per second at a few picojoule per bit. Uh, let us see how we can do that. Before that, let us see what applications should it enable. Uh, one application is you imagine you have your phone and you have taken video all day and you want to transfer it. Today, what we do is we go either we try to sync to the cloud that is very slow and drowns out battery, or we come back and connect a uh, wire. You have to uh, connect the wire to get that energy efficiency. Instead, what you can do is you can have this proximity communication in the device and the laptop and come back and put it right on top of each other. So this is like NFC near field communication, but near field communication is less than megabits per second. This enables 32 gigabits per second at extreme high energy efficiency. Similarly, other applications could be from a phone to a mat. While charging, you can do data transfer. And because this is this does not have exposed electrodes, it can make things hermetically sealed, uh, meaning it is not exposed to the elements, water, and things like that. So, what is proximity communication? Uh, from basic of uh, electromagnetics, we know when devices are very close in the it's in the near field region, and you can transfer uh, data using either or capacitive fields or electromagnetic fields. Uh, there are each of them have different characteristics. For inductive that uses H field, because of the way we implement the inductors and the, there are multi turn, uh, there are inter turn capacitances between this multi turn inductor, and hence the self resonance frequency of inductive proximity communication is very low. So, this shows how the inductive channel looks like. So, there is good coupling but only in a narrow bandwidth. Now, there has been uh, work on transmission line coupling which uses EM fields which gives you a wide band coupling and low loss, but because you are EM, using EM fields which die out slower, if you want to have multiple channels of these parallel to each other to trans increase the data rate, uh, they have a lot of crosstalk in between. So, from one channel to the receiver you have signal, but from that channel to the receiver side uh, beside it also has a lot of crosstalk. So, we choose uh, the capacitive coupling which has still has wide bandwidth, but it has much lower crosstalk because it is using electrical fits and also we can cancel some of this crosstalk and we will show how. The fundamental of this concept is that we have two metal plates in both the devices and these two metal plates when brought together forms a capacitance that is here called CC and also because we are using MOS devices to receive this data, these MOS fits have some capacitance at the input. C, CR that is receiver capacitance which includes the receiver uh, MOS capacitance plus other ESD capacitance or any capacitance that is there in the receiver. So, if you see it is a capacitive divider which means ideally it is flat over all frequency CC by CC plus CR that is the loss. So, if you can increase this capacitance the loss reduces. In reality though you have vias going up to these capacitances also the capacitances itself when they become big they have uh, distributed inductance which leads to self resonance and hence this ideal flat response becomes a peaking response. However, you still have a wide band in which you can communicate. So, the first problem in pro capacity proximity communication for millimeter scale is the self resonance frequency. Second is crosstalk that means when you have two of these uh, parallel channels you along with your desired coupling you have a crosstalk capacitance to the parallel channel which means your received signal here gets its desired plus crosstalk from all different places and the eye diagram of the received signal gets closed. So, we will see how we can fix those first the crosstalk. To fix the crosstalk we implemented this uh, structure where it shows a four differential couplers which arranged like this such that the coupling from 1 minus to 3 plus and 3 minus is equal and when you take differentially they are cancelled. 
Similarly, the coupling from 1 plus and 1 minus on to 2 minus is already equal and opposite because this is 1 plus and 1 minus. So, they are automatically cancelled. So, this shows a struct a coupler a capacitive coupler structure which is inherently crosstalk uh, can, uh, cancelling. It has a very compact area because it is like a fractal and you can keep on repeating. You have four of these you can keep on repeating in all directions. So, that is the first innovation that remo uh, reduces crosstalk significantly. The second part of the in innovation is mitigating the effect of self resonance frequency and let us see what happens. So, our transmitter for here is in 1, we are trying to transmit to the other side of 1 that is shown by this black curve and then the crosstalk from on the other side of 1 from 2, 3 and 4 are shown over, over here. This uh, uh, So, as you see because of the self resonance, if you send a pulse, the pulse response has the desired received signal plus a lot of ringing is some called a decision feedback equalizer where you try to find the values at each point and cancel the taps. But then you can imagine how many taps you will need and that is extremely inefficient. So, we came up with a new called the integrative DDR receiver and we have uh, applied it for this cross uh, for this self for mitigating the self resonance frequency. Let us see how does it work. If you integrate this pulse equal to the resonance period, period of this resonance, if you integrate a sine wave over its whole period, the contribution is 0, right. However, the signal because it is 1 0, the signal is constant. So, you are getting the integrated signal, you are getting a SNR advantage and the integrated interference is 0. So, that leads to a notch equal to 1 by self resonance frequency, if we choose the bit period is equal to 1 by SNR and you can cut out this self resonance. So, we saw that when we went from micrometer scale capacitance to millimeter scale capacitance because of the big capacitances, we had self resonance that was the biggest problem. Using this technique, we can get rid of that and the filtered uh, and it is not a notch filter because you cannot implement those uh, very easily uh, with this kind of a rejection. Uh, with the signal processing, it is a thin waveform that we can re receive and it, these consume only microwatts of power. We taped out the whole system and uh, this was published this ISSCC and PC and we could achieve 8 gigabit, we had 4 channels as you saw, we could achieve 8 gigabits per second per channel, total of 32 gigabits per second at only 4 picojoule per bit. This implements the world's first capacitive proximity communication at millimeter scale. Before this Sun Lab have implemented at micrometer scale where the cell resonance frequency was not a problem. Uh, and if you compare this with comparable solutions like Y gig, which is the next closest one, is 250x better power. Uh, if you compare with something like uh, better energy, I should say, energy efficiency. And if you compare with something like RF, it is even better. And this is, these are at ISO data rate. So, with that, uh, to summarize, we have talked about IOC, IoT sensor nodes and we have looked at always on sensings and how in situ analytics, in sensor analytics can compress the data. We have seen how context awareness in the analytics as well as in the communication can give us lot of savings. For example, we saw uh, how zero margin radio and self learning radio ca can achieve 3x up to 3x benefit. Those would be intra phi adaptation and then if you want more than 10x, you have to switch the phi. One example was a proximity communication that can achieve up to 250x. So, what are the challenges and opportunities in this space? We need to design algorithms and systems for these sensors within tiny power budget. We need to understand the context. So, we need these sensors that can tell us, okay, this is what the context is, which are user needs, channel conditions, application latency, QoS, requirements, battery conditions, process variation, and the list goes on. We need in sensor analytics to compress the data because of. Uh, we know that we cannot send all this data to the cloud because we are in constant and for the we need to optimally add context such that the application specific definition of information is defined and extracted. All data is not needed for a given application only we need some part of the information. So, we need to go from data to information in the sensor itself. 
or else we are communicating too much and burning energy. We need design of these blocks where each of these blocks need to be designed with power and performance trade off so that we can tune them to the context. And we have to think about test also because test be, because we are designing adaptive systems, the test and validation of the system at, has to be at multiple different points instead of the design point like instead of a one point where it is designed like today's systems. Also the test and validation of closed loop systems are very important. In conclusion, IoT brings us wide variation in dynamic workload in sensing, processing and communication. We have seen energy constraint IoT sensor nodes would require minimum energy operation at all times. We should not do too much guard banding or worst case design anymore. We have seen examples that context awareness in, and in, uh, can achieve a lot of energy efficiency like in sensor processing for gesture recognition could do 800x compression, uh, interfi adaptation can achieve up to 3x and then interfi adaptation the example we show uh, could achieve 250x energy efficiency benefit. In future we can uh, start merging these things like uh, the previous speaker was mentioning between the sensing in sensor analytics and communication so that they talk to each other and become even more energy efficient. We would like to acknowledge our colleagues at Georgia Tech, Intel Labs, Qualcomm and Rambus, uh, GSRC, FCRP, NSF, Purdue, Georgia Tech, as well as Air Force, Yemen Institute Program, SRC and Intel and Entity Fellowship. Thank you. Uh, questions please.